doing, then turned, embarrassed, face flushed with tequila and shame, and staggered into the alley. Crazy old bitch, he muttered. The alley was a chiaroscuro wash of shadows, contrasted against the backdrop of trash can fires, their dancing flames too dim to clarify those gathered around them. Brant studied the darkened doorways and alcoves, but there was no sign of the musician. Brant cocked his head to one side, listening. The notes were no less clear, but neither did they help him to narrow his search. The tequila wasn't helping either. He narrowed his eyes, swept his gaze over the alley a final time, and lurched toward the wall of a nearby building. There were no fires too near, no future of the nowhere musician wraiths to beg or harass him. He spun, leaned against the dirty brick, and slid down to the ground with a soft thud. Somehow, he managed to hold the bottle up so it didn't smash on the ground, and the guitar case so his instrument wouldn't crack or break. His ass was less fortunate, but the Cuervo numbed the pain. Without hesitation, he slid the guitar case to his side, unhooked the clasps, and opened the lid. The polished wood glowed dimly in the flickering orange light. Brant stared at the instrument for a long time. He wanted to play. He wanted to play so badly his fingers itched and his mind whirled. The whirling was too much tequila and not enough inspiration. Then he heard the harmonica again, really heard it, and his hand slipped down to grip the neck of the guitar. He pulled it free of the case, letting it rest gently and comfortably on his leg, and listened carefully to the melody of the lone harpist. Brant might not be able to find the man, but he could hear, he could feel. He remembered the barmaid's words, You look like a dead clown. He thought of Shaver's comment on his newest version of the makeup he'd worn since his first performance. It set him apart, erected a wall between Brant and the band. They did not join the show or condone it. He could play, write, and sing, so they let him be. It's all such a drama to you, Shaver had said, watching him apply the white face and the rouge, the exaggerated eyes, lined in pain and outlined in deeper black than the shadowy depths of the bar's corners. That shit went out with kiss. Brant reached up gently, slowly tracing a nail through the smeared makeup. Drama. Shaver had no idea. Brant's fingers slid to the strings gently. His eyes closed. He let his mind slide as well, let it slip to darkness, to thoughts of his bills, his landlady, anything to bring him down to those notes. He felt his fingers twitch, reaching for the strings. He held them back. So deep. He wanted to blend with that sound, to feel the notes flow up and through him. He couldn't bring himself to try. Though the desire to play was a physical ache so powerful it nearly doubled him over, something even the tequila had failed to do, he held his fingers still. Heart thudding a dull rhythm in his chest, he stared into the darkness, listening as the tears flooded his eyes and washed down his cheeks again. He couldn't fucking play. The sound took him back, months back. The band had been on a rare road trip to the edge of town, opening for some skinhead local noisemongers with a following and an attitude. The set ended early. Cynthia had been drunker than Brand himself for a change and had not been ready to call it a night. Somehow her wobbly enthusiasm and half a hit of acid had brought them further still from the center of the city to the fringes of a small carnival. The Ferris wheel had been so short it seemed a toy, and the booths were lined with the seediest of the seedy. Lost men and women, boys and girls, eyes vacant of humanity and burning with a hunger that only the laughter, money, and dreams of the uninitiated could sate. Sin had been oblivious to it all. She dragged Brant, her small hand gripping his wrist from booth to booth, through the funhouse and its mirrors. Long faces and short bodies, endless legs, and his mind traveling the length of her till they spun out and away again, ending in front of an old tent. The doors to that tent flapped loudly in the stiff breeze. The sign said simply, Fortunes. 
They'd stood there a long moment, and then Sin had lurched forward. Inside was a single table, a crystal ball resting on wooden feet in the center. Sin had approached it fearlessly, dragging Brant like a faulty anchor. With a quick motion, she'd spun him before her and pressed him into the chair, leaning over his shoulder gently, her lips so close to his ear as she whispered that he felt her hot breath, felt little sizzles of energy as the LSD sparkled through his senses. Find out the future, Brant. Find out how famous we will be. Find out if you get lucky tonight. Her tongue had traced his ear then, and Brant looked up. There was an old woman seated across from him that Brant hadn't noticed when they'd entered. She was cloaked in dark colors and slumped in her chair, eyes hidden by the deep folds of her robe. All Brant remembered were those deep, piercing eyes and the card. The woman had long, slender fingers, bony and blue-veined. Her nails were too long, curled under and yellowed. She had flipped the card, a single card, before a word was spoken, before Brant could protest that he did not want a reading, before sin could cajole him into it, before reality could truly solidify in any real way, the fingers flipped and the card turned. The fool inverted, head down to the ground and ass to the stars. Brant had stared, mesmerized. White-faced clown, idiot savant, stepping into the void, long-fanged dog dangling from its grip on the fool's ass. And the cliff. Forever. Everything and nothing, cost and lost, in a single false, clueless step. He'd staggered to his feet, turned to the door and fallen, Sin's hand on his shoulder. That had been all it took, that slight imbalance. He remembered her cursing, his feet tangling and the ground rising much too quickly as he threw his hands out in a futile gesture of denial. His chin had connected with moist earth, his eyes flashing with the strobed images of the fool, and the ground spilled drinks and flecks of cotton candy filling his vision. He'd crawled forward, trying to drag himself free of the crackling grip of the visions, the melting images of reality and the sudden pounding of pain in his head that threatened to cancel consciousness absolutely. One hand at a time, fingers gripping the dirt and dragging him forward, he'd moved from the tent and rolled to his back, closing his eyes to clear his thoughts. Sin was over him in seconds, face too close, voice too loud, and slender fingers slapping him sharply on the cheek. She'd spoken to him, but her words were slurred, lengthening impossibly and blurring to incomprehensible noise. He didn't know if it was his mind or hers that was snapping. Brant had opened his eyes then and seen it. Far above him, looming like a monstrous insect, the Ferris wheel. So small and insignificant as they'd approached the carnival, loomed immensely, the image so powerful that it nearly stole his breath. Brant had watched, mesmerized, horrified. His angle allowed a clear view of the bottoms of the seats as they spun down, feet, legs, and then faces. He'd watched, and again, Sin's hand cracking into his cheek leaving white to red splotched images of her touch as the odd, disjointed music of the carnival played in the background. The wheel had spun, and Brant had seen the image clearly. The noose, dangling from the framework, and the fool, dangling from the end in a St. Vitus dance to oblivion. Then it was gone, so many shadows spinning up and away with the motion of the wheel, and spirits, LSD, and noise. He remembered Sin helping him clumsily to his feet, scolding him for being a weird fuck and the staggering return trip to the streets, to a dirty taxi neither of them could afford, and home, the images replaying relentlessly in his mind. Brant shook his head and the alley came into focus. Shadows shifted, emptied of nothingness to be filled with slowly moving figures, bright-eyed wraiths shuffling from the darkened corners, a single unit of disjointed members. There was no threat in their approach. As they drew nearer, Brant was able to make out the central figure through the glistening, salt-haloed lenses of his tears. 
darker than the others. <laughs>